Welcome, everybody. Thank you for sharing this afternoon with me. Um, currently, I'm uh, the medical director at our Valley Medical Group Primary Walking Care um, in Dumont. I'm a board certified uh, family medicine physician, so I see everybody um, from babies to adults um, and everything in between. Um, I also have a, a long history in education. I've been in the education world probably longer than I've been a physician. Um, since about 2006. So um, this is a passion of mine. I love to teach. I love to talk to patients, get to know them and, and guide them on their health. So I hope that this information, you, if you're a man, I hope you uh, come see one of our great uh, physicians or nurse practitioners or PAs that we have in Valley. Or um, if you're a spouse, a child, someone who is concerned about a man in your life uh, and his health, you know, bring him in so that um, he can get a check. This is a, a general health um, lecture. So it's coming from a primary care perspective. Um, and I'll try to cover the most pressing topics, really, what people come into the clinic for, why they come in, what's concerning them, and then hit the points that are most important as far as like screening, mental health, preventative care, things like that. You're, you're gonna see a reoccurring theme of diet and exercise. So bear with me because that is, you know, the the, the beginning of our healthcare. Um, so you'll see that throughout. And um, as Sue mentioned, if you have further questions um, at the end, we'll have some time to um, for me to answer anything else that you might have popped up. Okay, so first thing. So what's happening in men's healthcare? It's important to know what the statistics show. In, in the 1920s, uh, women outlived men by just one year. Um, nowadays, it's a five to six year gap. Women are living about six years longer than men. Um, a lot of the reasons are when the when you did these studies, and these are uh, community studies that go out done by the government and other um, agencies that uh, capture vital statistics of the United States. Um, cardiovascular disease, metabolic issues like diabetes and cancer. Um, but the bigger portion of that was related to men seeking health care and the lack of, right? So there's a lack of insurance, there's a lack of access, there's a lack of um, urgency sometimes with men. Um, actually, statistics show that men are seven times less likely to see a doctor or a health care provider in comparison to women. Um, and, you know, we talk about numbers because not to shame anyone, it's just this is what the data showed. So we know that there's an issue with getting men in to see someone. So the point is not to let's, you know, as a community, as our loved ones um, need this assessment, even if it's just annually, to connect them with care. Um, the other thing, a lot of the deaths that occur in men are 50% of them are going to be preventable, meaning that there is something that they're dying from that can we can actually prevent, right? So those are the things that we're going to talk about today. The other part to this is men tend to have higher risk occupations and um, behaviors, right? So think of a policeman, a fireman, a construction worker, alcohol use, drug use, things like that. Um, it's seen uh, more often in men. And so these are things that in a primary care visit is screened and addressed. So getting in to see someone is important. So how do we start? We are, it's, it's really first the patient wanting to come in, coming in to see their healthcare professional, um, at least even seeing someone annually has been shown to improve people's outcomes or men's outcome, getting their recommended age appropriate screenings um, which we'll talk about today with uh, tailored to men, a uh, healthy diet, exercise, and weight control, right? Because we know that all these things impact health. So this is really a preventative approach to health, right? When people already have medical problems, it's called secondary prevention. So we're trying to keep things in control and at bay. So it's not, it, it may not be that they'll see someone annually. They should probably see someone at least twice a year, three or four times a year. And that's always tailored to the patient's uh, medical issues. So when is it time to get something checked out? Sometimes people don't know when it's time to see someone, right? And so there's always warning signs. The body, is a machine, it works perfectly. But when it doesn't work perfectly, it's gonna start to show you some signs. And these are what we call warning signs. 
this is when you should come get it checked out. Sometimes it could be trivial, but other times it could be a warning sign. And so we want patients to come in because you don't know unless you do some blood work, uh, a physical exam, things like that. And that should be done by your primary care provider. So things that you should look out for, or if you know that your loved one has this issue, you should have them come in to see someone. And so a bowel or bladder changes, um, impotence or erectile dysfunction, any pain that just doesn't go away, it's pers persistent. And then depression, right? Depression is something that can look very different in men. Um, it's not this sadness or crying. Um, for some uh, patients, it can be anxiety, it could be irritability, it could be changes in their sleep. Um, it could be just feelings of emptiness, uh, lack of interest in doing what they like to do, like go golfing or whatever other things, hobbies that they have, and even changes in um, decreased, uh, or I'm sorry, decreased sex drive, right? So um, not intimacy issues with their partners. Um, the other thing is um, mental health for men is, is a issue because they have the highest suicide rate and it, it does uh, increase with age. So this is something that we'll talk about as well because um, men are affected by depression just like women can be in other populations. So when you go to see someone, right? Let's say you haven't, I have patients that they're like, hey, doc, I haven't seen someone in three, five, 10 years, whatever. It happens, you know, there's different reasons why people don't come in. But when you do come in and you're ready to, you know, approach your health in a preventative way, we, we are going to ask a lot of questions. I know I do. My patients know me for that. I'm very detailed. I will ask, you know, personal health, surgery, allergies, medication use, over-the-counter, over social habits, which is like smoking, drinking, sexual health, um, family history is very important. So having that information when you come into the visit is important because this is how we stratify people's risk and what they're what they should screen for. Um, any symptoms that you have going on, right? So something that you're like, you know what, I keep having like this pain in my in my knee, right? Things like that can be discussed. Bringing a list of medications that you have been prescribed and maybe stop using or use from uh, other doctors or specialists that you see. Um, and then you, you should expect to have a head to toe physical exam, a review of your body systems, which is the symptoms that I mentioned, vital signs are taking, so blood pressure, things like that, blood drawn. And then a lot of times you, your primary care provider is going to update your vaccines and talk to you about any screenings. So we, and then you usually, will end up with a very personalized list of things that you should do. Um, and then a lot of times it helps people to bring someone with them, right? Um, I have patients that always bring a spouse or a child or whoever they um, you know, feel comfortable with. And this is shown to help people just take a little bit more charge of their care and come in to discuss because it's a lot of, there's a lot of information and it can be scary. It can be daunting, right? It's a lot to talk about. Um, but it's important. I mean, we have to talk about it. Otherwise, if we don't talk about it, then things can be missed. And then we don't want patients to come in when it's too late, right? So that disease gets so advanced that now they're having permanent disabilities or, or death, you know, things that can uh, be more complicated than from when it started. So that's important. So a lot of times it's really just starting to come in. All right. And so now in the beginning, um, you want to start with just basic things, right? I like to talk to patients about what is the routine things you should be doing, right? So don't forget your eyes, ears, and mouth, right? So eyes, um, it's recommended that patients get screened every one to two years. Um, if you wear any type of corrective lens, it might be a little more frequent. But the purpose of screening um, is to capture disease, right? There's things behind the eye that cannot be seen just with the naked eye. So you need to have a dilated exam, things like cataracts, things like glaucoma, these things run in people's families. So getting the screenings is a way to catch it ahead of time. When you catch things ahead of, ahead of time, it, outcomes are better, treatment is, is sooner and tend to be improved um, or improve the outcomes as well. Um, so we you know, always stress, like if you notice a change in your vision, come in and get that checked in. But vision can also be a medical problem, right? Um, sometimes patients can have uh, diabetes uh, and they can have blurred vision and you're not gonna know you have diabetes unless you do some blood work. So coming in to just 
check that out. Why you're having a change in your vision is important too. Um, hearing loss is important as well. Um, people tend to think that hearing loss happens at like 65, which is not true. Um, hearing loss can happen as young as 40 or 45 years of age. Most people are still working at that age, right? Um, there's a lot of reasons why people have hearing changes or loss. It could be maybe a job, right? Some men, they're mowing the lawn, they are um, welding, they're, uh, they have noise exposure for long periods of time, sustained years. Um, this can cause damage to the ears. Um, and then we talk about occupational hazards, right? So should you be wearing earmuffs when you're doing this job, right? And so that's a conversation that can be had because you may not think about it at 25 and then at, at 40, now you're, you lost your hearing, right? Or have diminished hearing. And then of course, getting the evaluation of establishing what type of hearing loss you're having. Can, do you qualify for hearing aids? That would be the treatment, right? If there is a, a, a significant loss of hearing. Teeth, oral care, um, there's a lot of conditions that start in the mouth. Many dentists have actually referred patients because they know that there's bone changes, they can see that there's gum disease, um, sometimes even hypertension obviously would be like, obvious things are like cavities, right? But the bacterial part is important because any gum disease can encourage bacterial overgrowth. And the first place that bacteria can go is the heart. So it's actually very important to have a good dental hygiene and every everybody should be seeing a dentist, if not twice a year, more than twice a year, depending on your personal, you know, some patients build up more plaque than others. So they might go three or four times per year, but that's important as well. And then just basic hygiene at home, right? You're brushing and flossing at least twice a day or at least after every meal. And these are just general recommendations, preventative um, things that we recommend so that you are not forgetting your senses, right? Like your sight, your hearing, mouth, taste, things like that. Um, and then if we need to, we always include obviously specialists, right? If you need to see the eye doctor, we put you with an eye doctor. If you need to see a ear, nose and throat doctor, we link you to care there and then dentistry, you know, it can be very expensive, um, but again, it's, it's preventative, right? So if you only have to do the things twice per year, then that's twice per year. And then the rest is really daily maintenance. So these are things that we shouldn't forget because it can still affect the rest of your health, right? So now, one of the probably biggest topics for men is cardiovascular health. So we're going to start there, okay? And I just highlighted the four more most common issues um, that present in men because it's all focused on prevention. Like, how do we reduce the risk of cardiac disease and death in men, starting with cholesterol? So cholesterol, um, cholesterol is a good thing. It helps us to build our the walls of the cell in our body. It helps with digestion and helps. And there's uh, some hormone production that occurs in the um, cholesterol that uh, allows us to function normally. However, when there's too much cholesterol, um, like anything in life, too much is not good for you, right? So what now an abnormality occurs, and then you have this excess cholesterol floating around in the blood. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that this uh, cholesterol is going to start to form a plaque. So if you see in the picture here, a plaque is basically an obstruction in blood flow in your important in arteries, right? So the blood flow. And this is a multi-organ issue because it, not only is your heart going to be affected, but anything that receives blood, which is everything in your body. So sometimes it can look, and it's not necessarily that uh, patients are going to come in with a heart attack. They may come in with uh, erectile dysfunction, right? Because uh, men require blood flow in order to have an erection. So patients are coming in and now this is already a late symptom. This is not an early symptom. This is because this is going to happen over time. So now what type of uh, issues are, do patients have that can promote this? It's going to be diabetes. A, per, a family history, if there's a strong history of high cholesterol, if there's a personal history of high cholesterol, which a lot of patients are not friendly with the cholesterol medication. Um, so people have high cholesterol and they go off the medicine and then they go back up. And so they're constantly with this high cholesterol. Um, if there's heart attacks or heart disease in your family, um, young people, yes, less than, uh, younger than 50 years old, 
tobacco use, alcohol use, um, hypertension, so high blood pressure, and then of course, weight, right? So if we're overweight or we gain a significant amount of weight, which is more than 10 pounds, uh, you're going to have some issues with cholesterol. Um, so again, you, you're not necessarily going to have the symptoms from hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol, but you will have medical issues. And then those medical issues can bring about the symptoms. Uh, we diagnose this uh, by a lipid panel. We do a blood draw. Um, if it's high and there's you know, concern, like if this is an accurate lab, we can repeat it and we do two labs as it's high and that's a formal diagnosis, right? We use the blood work. Then we talk about treatment. So treatment, again, the running theme is always going to be diet and exercise, which is lifestyle changes. Um, a low fat diet, a low cholesterol diet is, is the key. Um, and then exercise, um, because exercise burns off all that excess cholesterol that you may have in your bloodstream. Um, and so it's, this is going to be the mainstay of treatment. Some patients, even with the right diet, even with exercise, are still going to remain with very high levels of cholesterol, which can be dangerous because we know high cholesterol can cause a heart attack, it can cause a stroke, it can cause um, peripheral arterial disease, which is in the le lower uh, legs, the kidneys, there's a, it's your vascular system. So anything that receives blood can be affected. So we need to treat it. So how do we treat this? Uh, yes, we have medications that are very effective. Um, usually within three months, patients will have an improvement in their levels um, as long as they take the medicine daily. Um, and we always make um, a calculated decision, right? So we use what's called the ASCVD risk calculator. And this, these are parameters for patients to see if they are a candidate for treatment. Not everybody has to go on medicine, contrary to popular belief. Um, not everybody wants to put you on medicine, but certain things require medicine because we look at the risk benefit. The risk of having heart attack, stroke, things like that is higher than the benefit, than the risk of a medication maybe giving you side effects. But again, if there's side effects, there's ways to manage that as well. It's always just having that conversation with your healthcare professional if something you're taking is causing you a symptom, right? Or a side effect, as we say. So it really comes back to just how we're treating overall our body, right? So we're managing our other medical problems. So if there's a setting of diabetes, high blood pressure, the weight, smoking, alcohol, all these things have to be improved upon because if not, we will continue to have this high cholesterol issue and eventually, you know, can lead to the complications, okay? So the next thing that we tend to see a lot in uh, primary care is high blood pressure. Um, which is defined as um, the systolic blood pressure greater than 140 or the diastolic uh, blood pressure greater than 90. Um, so think top number is systolic, bottom number is diastolic. Um, if you're less than 60 years old and your pressure is above 140 or greater than 90, you have high blood pressure. Um, how we diagnose this is you have to have two readings um, in separate occasions of uh, greater than the 140 or the greater than the 90. If you're older than 60, it's 150 for the top number, okay? So this is uh, these are the parameters that we look for, but a lot of times patients who monitor their pressure at home will also have um, these, these logs that they bring in and then we see their average is really high. So this is when we, again, move to treatment. But before that, we talk about high blood pressure because if you see the, the data is there, 78 million adults in this country um, are affected by high blood pressure. It is the leading, leading cause of death in the world. Okay, so it's a very important topic and men and women are equal in uh, being affected. So it's a really, really big issue. Um, and so we always have to address that and we have to um, really um, get it under control, especially when patients are diagnosed really young, right? So 40s, 50s, you know, we're really aggressive with treatment so that we can prevent all the complications that come with high blood pressure, which are many. Um, and you'll see the risk factors are always the same. It's weight, it's diet, it's inactivity, um, people not having access to healthcare, right? Um, alcohol use, drug use, uh, certain uh, 
things like cocaine can cause it. Increasing age, yes. Um, and then family history, always, you we can't change our genetics and then diabetes. And you'll find that a lot of these diseases because they work in the same way, they are connected, right? You'll see patients that they have high blood pressure, they have diabetes, they have high cholesterol. Um, and the treatment is really all the same. It's really, what, what are you doing with your diet? What are you doing with your activity levels? What are you doing um, with your weight, right? And weight is sneaky. It, it, a lot of times patients um, don't realize they've gained weight because they aren't checking or no one else is checking because they're not going into the doctor. Um, so we, we think about it um, in the risk factor, right? So like, what's the complication of high blood pressure, right? And I always tell my patients when they come to see me, um, high blood pressure, you th I think about what it's going to do to you in 20 years. I don't think about what it's doing right now because I know what's happening right now. It's high, but in 20 years, so like a 65 year old, 70 year old person, um, you can have a heart attack. You can have a stroke. You have chest pain, um, all the time, renal failure, um, erectile dysfunction, and of course death. So we treat it because we know that high blood pressure, one affects a lot of people, but also, um, kills a lot of people, right? So what's the issue with high blood pressure and why, what's happening with um, the symptoms? High blood pressure a lot of times does not have symptoms. Um, and so people are just walking around with high blood pressure and have no idea. And then one day when it gets really, really out of control, which is a severe case of hypertension, they may have symptoms. They'll have a headache, they have lightheadedness, nausea, shortness of breath, they can feel really antsy nosebleeds, um, palpitations, you know, it could be one or all of these. And then also it could just be a stroke or a heart attack, right? So this is why um, the just checking in with someone for your, for your blood pressure or even checking your own blood pressure is, is important because that is also helpful if people monitor themselves at home. And a lot of times we'll get patients that will come, for example, from an employee health fair and their pressure was really high and they were sent in to see a doctor or their primary care uh, providers so that they can get treatment. Um, and if you see again, um, the treatment, I always start everything with lifestyle. Um, I'm a big advocate of lifestyle. It's how you eat, it's your activity, it's your weight management. Um, and then obvious, the obvious things that we know, no smoking, minimal drinking, no drug use, the things that you know aren't healthy first. And then if those things don't work um, and by not working, that means that you've done a three month trial, right? So you don't have to jump to medication unless you're in the high 160s, 170s, 180s, then you know it's not safe to really go on without medicine. But if patients are like 140, over 90, you know, we can always do a trial, a three month trial, that's the recommendation of lifestyle changes, right? So allowing the patient to cut back in the salt, exercise more, lose some weight, and then come back in and see what the pressure looks like. Um, when that doesn't work, then we implement medication, right? Because again, we're looking at the risk. What is the risk of the patient versus the benefit of medicine? The risk is all the complications that I mentioned. Um, and so it's a, it's a conversation to have, okay? Um, and it's treatable, right? It's something, again, going back to reduction of death in men. 50% of death in men is preventable. Blood, blood pressure management is one of them. So we really emphasize treatment and treatment of everything, right? So if they have diabetes, we treat the diabetes. If they have sleep apnea, we treat that. If they have cholesterol issues, we treat that. Um, biofeedback is another, um, I won't say it's new, but I would say it's being more recognized in the medical world. And this is essentially like stress management, right? How do you deal with your stress? Um, this could be like meditation, yoga, um, mindfulness, deep breathing, things like that, that also help patients because stress in general can also invoke a lot of these diseases. And then anyone that has high blood pressure, all my patients, I always recommend to them, you should monitor your blood pressure at home. It may not have to be daily, but you should keep an eye on it, right? So when you're not feeling well, when you feel off is... You know, it's a very generic term, but that's how patients report it back. They're like, I feel weird. So, okay, check your pressure. And, and making that a habit is another way to make sure that we're properly treating uh, people's uh, high blood pressure. Okay, and that information is great to bring back 
whether uh, to your primary care doctor or physician or nurse practitioner or cardiology, whoever you see for um, this issue. And a lot of times, blood pressure is managed by primary care. Um, we escalate to cardiology for certain cases, of course, because if a patient, uh, let's say they're on three medications and they're, they're still not under control, they should see cardiology. If they have other comorbidities that put them at, at more at risk, cardiology, we always want to use our specialists um, so that we get a comprehensive uh, evaluation and, and make sure that the treatment is, is effective for patients. Um, and then another broad topic um, is um, atherosclerosis, but again, ties in all together. It's all related to cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, and then again, the same risk factors, the smoking, family history, age, diabetes, obesity. And again, this is a buildup of plaque in the arterial blood flow to your heart and vital organs. So it can look, it, it can have symptoms, right? Because if you have no blood flow, it's, there's no nutrition, there's no oxygen going to the tissue. So this can seem like, this could be like a chest pain, but it could also be leg pain. Some patients may experience leg pains if they have like peripheral artery disease. And so when they walk, they, they can't walk more than a block or two without um, very severe leg pain. And essentially it's because there's not enough oxygen getting to the tissue. Um, so it goes back to also treatment, right? So we're making sure that we're eating a better diet, we're exercising. Um, and then we have a test um, at, uh, that help us to decide if a patient needs to be on medicine. It's another tool that we have. Um, it's called the coronary calcium uh, score. And it's a, a non-contrast CT study that looks at the burden of the coronary arteries uh, to see if, if, and stratify the risk, right? So mild, moderate, severe. And then that helps guide, you know, the clinician on, okay, what medication and how, what dosing you should be on um, in conjunction with aspirin or blood pressure medicine. Um, in severe disease, of course, um, you're going to see a cardiologist because you may need a, a stent, right? And so when patients get stent placement, it's obviously more advanced disease. So this is going to be handled by a specialist um, because a lot of times you will need more medication to help um, to prevent, right? So once you have the stent in, now you're going to have a different plan because um, you want to prevent any more or uh, future stent placement or, of course, heart attack. And again, the treatment will always be in conjunction with your diet and exercise, okay? And watching the smoking and, the, and well, no smoking and then uh, avoiding alcohol. And Valley offers this test um, for, I think it's $99 um, if you don't. Uh, and patients, I've had a few patients do it and they, they thought it was a great easy test and it gives the clinician a lot of information on you know, how to manage the patient best. Um, so another big topic in the cardiovascular system is stroke, okay? Um, I like this acronym because I think it's helpful for patients and their, and their loved ones um, because a stroke can happen anywhere, right? You could be out to dinner and all of a sudden your husband or spouse or loved one is, his face is drooping, right? You're eating salad and his face is drooping or his arm is weak or he's having slurred speech immediately you need to go to a hospital, right? This is a, a medical emergency and you should always go to a, a hospital emergency room um, because time is brain. So what that means essentially is that you want, the first thing you want to do is get to a facility that treats stroke, okay? Um, this is if you're out in the, in anywhere, but let's say a patient comes in because they're having these symptoms occasionally, it's going to be the same symptoms, right? Like facial asymmetry, drooping, weakness or on one side, arm numbness or tingling, um, balance, imbalance, uh, changes in vision. All these things are, are very concerning. So when I, if we have a patient that comes to the clinic because they're not sure, they're still going to go to the ER. But, you know, this I want this information to be useful for patients when they're not in a medical setting, that they're just out and about and they notice these things. You know, you want to call 911 or get that person to a, an ER. So what is a stroke? A stroke is uh, essentially a central nervous system infarcts on hemorrhages based on imaging and pathological and clinical findings. <clears throat> it's the fifth leading cause of death 
Um, 87% of strokes are ischemic. So that's related to high blood pressure issues. 10% um, are intracerebral and 3% are subarachnoid. Um, those are more commonly seen in patients that fall and hit the back of their head. Um, and then the intracerebral can be like clots or anything like that. Um, so what are the risk factors? If you've had a stroke before or you've had what's known as a transient ischemic attack, which is like a precursor to stroke, uh, if you've had these, uh, you're more at risk for having an actual stroke. The same thing, weight, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, sedentary lifestyle, right? So no exercise, diet, and smoking. Um, I know you're going to get tired of me saying that, but that's everything in medicine. <laughs> Um, and again, the symptoms, there could be speech changes, vision changes, uh, sensory changes, strength changes. Um, patients sometimes just collapse, um, that, which can be very scary. So obviously immediately needs to go to a hospital. Um, and then a patient is going to experience a really big workup in a hospital setting. Uh, there's going to be a history. There's going to be an exam, blood work, heart studies, uh, brain studies. And this is essentially to figure out what caused the stroke. Um, and then after the stroke, you will touch base again with your primary care doctor and other specialists, right? Because once it's identified what happened with that patient to lead them to that point, now we're, they're definitely going to be on some new medications. Um, rehab is an important thing, right? Because some people have strokes and they will have residual deficits, right? They may have speech issues. They can have memory issues. They can have strength issues, sens sensory issues. Um, so patients or speech issues, swallowing issues, there's a lot of things that can happen. So um, you're going to have to do therapy. Um, that's And all this is done, it's a protocol. So you go into a hospital, all these things are basically lined up as soon as a patient comes in and it's uh, carried out into the outpatient setting. Um, and you're not out of the woods. Uh, unfortunately, when a person has a stroke, um, they're at risk for a recurrent stroke, um, sores, pressure sores, especially if they can't move, um, infections, uh, they can have delirium, right? Because the memory and um, judgment, things like that can be affected in the brain. And a lot of, especially men do suffer from depression, right? This, could, this is a major life change. Um, and, you know, to not, to not be your usual health is is very hard for a lot of people. So we do see a lot of depression. Um, and a lot of this will be managed uh, with the primary care uh, provider um, so that they can get back on their feet and get back to the best state of health possible, right? So a lot of this, you know, will be um, through many, many months and sometimes years of, of um, following up with all the different aspects uh, or losses, right? So depending on what the patient uh, needs. And then prevention, a lot of times patients are going to be placed on aspirin. Um, they'll have a cholesterol medicine, diabetes, blood pressure, because these are the things that are, have probably caused the stroke, right? And they may have been unidentified or they may have been uncontrolled. So now we have to get them back into control. Um, and again, there you go, diet, exercise, smoking, and alcohol cessation. Um, reduction in alcohol, we'll talk about the details of moderate drinking. So that's your cardiovascular system. Next, I want to talk about the gastroenterology and digestive system. And again, there's a plethora of GI issues. I'm going to focus on the ones that are seen in primary care and what we address a lot of times. Um, constipation, acid reflux, and of course, colon cancer, because we send patients to screen. Okay. So constipation... Um, is defined as a stool frequency of less than three bowel movements per week and can be associated with difficulty passing the stool. So like straining, the stool can be really hard. It can look like little pellets, feeling like you're not emptying out um, and uh, painful bowel movements, right? Um, and this, when it's chronic, it's more than six months, right? And so a lot of times patients actually have had constipation since they were children. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to treat um, but it, there's ways to prevent it. Um, 33 million uh, adults are affected in the U.S. Uh, things that are not normal and will al should alarm you or will alarm your clinician is if, in addition to that, you're having unintentional weight loss, fatigue, rectal bleeding, uh, alteration in the bowel, so it's constipation one day, diarrhea another day, uh, or narrowing of the stool. This merits a colonoscopy as soon as possible. 
Um, so if if you notice this or you notice your loved one has this, you know, they need to come in right away. And um, the diagnosis is pretty standard. It's a history of physical. What are the, you know, the normal bowel habits of the patient? There's a criteria that we use, Rome, um, essentially, which identifies the type of, of constipation that there is and then how to treat it, right? So we have, of course, a high fiber diet, exercise, the increased hydration, bowel movement schedule. So actually going to sit on the, on the really similar to like when you potty train children, right? And you have to give them a schedule. Medication use, there are some medications out uh, that are helpful for people and people do end up using them, but we have to be careful because they can cause issues with the gut. So there's a fine balance. So this is why like following up with your primary care physician or a gastro uh, enterologist. Um, and then also the other part to this is med uh, underlying medical problems. So are we is there something else going on that they is causing the constipation and even the medications, right? There's a lot of medications that can cause constipation. So um, usually that's more easily identifiable because patients will take something and then they get constipated. So it's an easier connection to make. And then, you know, we can just remove the medication if it's safe to, and if not, then, you know, we try other um, approaches. So it's a very common issue. Um, complications can be hemorrhoids. Um, and anal fissures, which, which can, both can be painful. Um, the anal fissure is a little bit more painful and can also lead to like infections. So I, a lot of this is uh, really going to stem from prevention. So trying to prevent the constipation so we're not getting the hemorrhoids and the anal fissures, which is can be common and more uncomfortable than the constipation. So a lot of patients will come in and we talk about this um, because this can, as you get older, can become more uh, symptomatic. Next is acid reflux, uh, which everyone knows as heartburn, um, a regurgitation of stomach contents, mostly acid. Uh, patients will come in with like a burning sensation in the chest, going up into the throat, sometimes a bad a breath, or you know they just feel like a metallic taste in their mouth when they wake up. It affects a lot of people in, in this country, about 60 million. And primary care providers treat about 40 to six patients on average per month for this. So it's really, really common. Um, but as you can see the diagram, there's a ton of reasons why it's common, right? So it's, it can be age, it could be smoking, obesity. Um, some patients have what's known as a hiatal hernia. So that's an anatomical issue right inside, um, alcohol use. There's a lot of medications that can also cause uh, this and then large meals. So the more you eat, the more acid you need to break that meal down. So one of the treatments or approaches is small meals, right? So Big, big meal, more acid, small meal, less acid so that it's not coming up after. And then of course, fatty foods, right? Because we are, need more acid to break these things down. Then um, where you should be concerned is when there's symptoms such as involuntary weight loss associated, that's not normal in acid reflux, uh, anemia, right? So if the patient's coming in and we do blood work and they're anemic with the reflux, that's concerning any obstruction or bleeding, uh, voice changes, uh, persistent symptoms, even though we've tried treatment. And then anyone who's 50 years or older is automatic referral to get an endoscopy. Okay. And so this is um, where we would refer to the gastroenterologist. Okay. So a lot of times um, with treatment, it's going to be the diet changes, the weight loss um, medications. We have three classes of medicine that we can use. And usually uh, your primary care provider will start you on this trial for four to eight weeks. And if you improve, great. If you didn't, you can go see your the gastroenterologist um, and you know they may do the endoscopy or give you a different treatment. Um, and then there's surgery, but these are like usually severe cases. Right. Um, and so other things that people have um, that, that studies have shown is uh, elevating the bed, not going to sleep after a meal. So like at least an hour or two, even uh, our clothing. So wearing loose and comfortable clothing. And actually, it says at least three hours uh, after a meal. And when you're eating, sitting straight up and chewing your food slowly, these are just uh, ways to prevent the acid reflux. Ooh. That's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. Okay. And so now one of the most important screenings that um, I talk about with my patients is colorectal cancer screening because there's a lot of men affected by this. Um, and again, preventable. 
because we have a screening for it, right? So cancer, it does not discriminate, it, men, female, age, nothing. So we have a lot of variation in when we see colon cancer. So the screening tests have been developed in order to prevent, right? So it is the third most common cancer in the United States. Uh, risk factors include obesity, um, having a history of precancerous polyps, family history of colon cancer. Um, what can that look like? The patient might come in and say they've had like a rapid weight loss. They have, again, the anemia, any evidence of bleeding or obstruction in the stool. Um, uh, or they So obstruction, what would that feel like for a patient? So that means that they're going to eat and they just feel like they ate one bite and they're full already. That's early satiety. That's concerning, right? Because why would they be full just on eating one bite of food? Um, and then what do what do we have for screening, right? So screening tests, uh, we have two options um, depending on your risk, right? So risk is always gonna be determined by your history, your family history. So let's say a person has no history of family colon cancer. They don't have a history, no polyps, nothing like that. They're at average risk, and we start screening patients at 45. Um, it used to be 50, but actually more and more um, we're screening at 45 because it ca has captured more patients um, in a preventive fashion so that we can you know, treat sooner also if we catch the colon cancer. Um, screening after 75 um, is on a patient by patient basis, right? Depending on what's the history, is there a... Um, other risk factors for that patient that we will continue to screen. But most adults' average risk will screen from the ages of 45 to 75. Now, if there's a patient that comes in and tells me, um, yes, I have, my dad had colon cancer, my grandfather, whoever, um, especially if it's a first degree relative, which is your parent, um, second degree would be like an aunt or grandmother, things like that. Um, you will test, you will screen, um, starting at 40 years or uh, 10 years before the age of onset of the relative, right? So let's say dad had uh, cancer at 45, colon cancer at 45, you as, ch as the child will start at 35 to screen, okay? Because 35 is sooner than 40, right? So it's always the youngest age you start to screen first, okay? Um, that's for the colonoscopy. Now, some, a lot of patients actually do not want to do a colonoscopy because it is invasive, right? And you have to take a lot of solution to clear out the gut. Um, and if you don't do a proper prep, you have to repeat the colonoscopy. So, and then there's anesthesia, like it's a lot, but it's important, but it's a lot. It's a very well done, repeated um, procedure, but like anything, there can be complications. So some patients are afraid of that um, and just don't want the invasive procedure. So as long as there's no family history of colon cancer or um, a history in the patient, they can opt for the stool test. Um, patients tend to like that more um, because they could do it in the privacy of their home. Um, and then the frequency is either every year, every three years, depending on the brand of stool test that's used. Um, some of you may know it as Fit Test or the Cologuard, which is uh, a commercial seen on commercials. Um, and this is just as effective um, as far as the numbers, it's about 90 in the 90s uh, for 70 specificity and sensitivity. I have the numbers here. So the FIT test, it detects colon rectal cancer with 91% sensitivity and 90% specificity. Um, so this is really high, right? So we know that if a patient does the stool test and it comes back positive, meaning that there's blood in the stool, or, or uh, then they're set to do the colonoscopy anyway. Um, but patients that they come back with a negative result, it's reassuring that it's in the 90th percentile um, that it's actually going to capture. Um, and then patients can decide to do a colonoscopy if they change their mind with the stool test, they can always uh, resort to the colonoscopy. Um, and of course, if colon cancer is detected, uh, there is treatment, uh, a lot of times it will re uh, require a bowel resection, chemo, radiation. So that will be handled by the gastro and oncology team. Okay. All right. So moving on to another important topic for men uh, is the genital urinary system, the prostate, um, testosterone levels, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, erectile dysfunction, and testicular cancer. 
these are uh, diseases that affect men directly, um, but can also, you know, affect their partners, right? Because um, having a, a healthy sexual health uh, is important. So it can cause like discord and things like that. So it's important to talk about these things or, or bring your partner in to talk about these things. So the first uh, topic is prostate health. Um, so the prostate, it's a sex gland that uh, helps produce nutrients for sperm in order to be mobile and fertile um, to move into, um, if they're, you know, for fertility reasons. Uh, common things that we see in primary care is going to be an inflammation of the prostate, right? So something known as prostitis. Um, it's seen a lot in men that are younger than 50, um, but it also can be seen in older men. A lot of times it can be a bacterial infection or they had some type of procedure um, and they, after the procedure, got the infection. And it can look like an inflammation of the prostate and it can cause pelvic pain, um, urgency, frequency. Um, sometimes men can't urinate. Um, and so that's an issue because it's very painful uh, when you retain the urine. Um, and you need to come in, right? And you require a physical exam, urine tests. Uh, sometimes uh, urine culture is important so that we know what bacteria to treat. Um, and there's treatment, right? Uh, we give oral antibiotics. Um, some patients, if they're very uh, severely sick because, it can, because it's an infection, it can cause fever, chills, things like that. Patients will probably be better treated in a hospital setting. So they may receive IV antibiotics. Um, and then there's some, um, after some procedures with like urology, right, uh, prostate doctors, they will give you the antibiotics just to prevent an infection. So that's also done to prevent this. Um, it can be, it can become very complicated, right? So it can cause systemic symptoms. And then the other problem with that is it can be chronic. So some men can have recurrent. It's a very, actually very difficult um infection to treat in men. So um, unfortunately, some men will have recurrent episodes. And so as soon as they get the symptoms, you know, they should come in and get treated um, because this can reoccur for some men. Then we have um, also very common uh, enlargement of the prostate, which is also known as benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, it's about 50% of men that will suffer from this. Um, and let me move myself over here. By the ages of 50 and 60, they will develop BPH. This is just anatomy because the prostate is under the ure, uh, the uh, bladder. And so um, by the age of 75, about 95% of men have BPH, right? So it's extremely common. Um, it can just be that. It doesn't have to escalate to prostate cancer, but it, it can be uncomfortable for men because it affects their urinary um, habits. Um, it does happen more with age and then also if there's a strong family history as well. And it, this uh, complaints that men will have is that they're urinating frequently, they're getting up at night, they have this urge, but they can't get it all out. Uh, Nocturia is waking up like five times um, at nighttime just to um, urinate. Um, it, sometimes uh, men will complain that they're straining or there's like dribbling after or decreased stream. Um, in the flow of the stream of the urine, um, and then also sometimes just inability to enter their bladder completely. So it's very uncomfortable because um, they feel like they can't get the urine out and then it just sits there and then that puts them prone to infections as well. So coming in, getting uh, an exam of the prostate, right? So there's the digital exam um, and then there's blood work, uh, urinalysis. We check the PSA, which is a marker in the blood. And then sometimes men will also need some imaging. So um, it re does require an evaluation and um, your primary care provider can do this or a urologist as well, you know, whatever is easier access. Um, and it just, there is medicine that we have treatment um, called the alpha blockers. Um, and it's a class of medication that helps to reduce this uh, inflammation or growth in the prostate. And um, some men, when they don't do better with the medicine, then there's surgical options, right? So all that can all would be escalated to the urologist. So um, when patients come in, we have this uh, symptom index that we use. Uh, and essentially all it is is a, a tool for us to stratify. Is it mild, moderate, or severe? All right. And so a lot of times, but a lot of times it, people come in, it's moderate already because this is over time because the prostate will grow over time with age. So 
men do notice it. It actually is a reason that men will come in to the doctor. So that's a good thing. Um, but we want them to come sooner before the symptoms, right? So this will allow the clinician to uh, stratify their need for medicine or intervention or what's the next step. Okay. And then uh, moving to prostate cancer. So if you look at this chart, um, cancer in it's actually mixed. So we have female and male, um, but it is the, uh, one of the most common cancers in men in the US. And it's number four for cancer related deaths in men. So after lung cancer, colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancer. Um, prostate cancer is, is again, seen with aging um, when there's a strong family history, race. So it's seen more in black Americans um, and poor diet. Um, has been linked to it. Um, it can be symptomatic or asymptomatic, um, similar to what we talked about now with the enlarged prostate. The other things that may be unusual with the prostate cancer, though, is going to be like chronic pain, right? So men can complain of pain in the hips or thighs or lower back. Um, these should be like the alarm signs, right? If you're having these urinary issues plus this pain that's just, you know, newly onset, that's the time to come in and get checked out. Um, and we check, and also blood in the urine or semen can be common. So this is another reason to come get evaluated because we have testing, we check the urine and the image, we biopsy, okay, and confirm or rule out if it's a true cancer. And then there's different treatment options. Uh, some men will are okay with surveillance, meaning that they have a follow-up, they check their blood work, they do the rectal exam, other men have to have their prostate removed, there's radiation, there's hormone therapy, there's cryotherapy, there's a ton of uh, treatment. So it's a very treatable um, cancer to have. Um, it, and of course, cancer is always scary because of the complications of cancer, uh, being able to move, right? Metastasis of cancer is always uh, an, a risk. So getting people in, starting their screenings early. So coming into the doctor annually to get checked out, um, is prevention, right? So that's what we encourage. So a lot of men come in um, to clinic and they do complain about um, a low sex drive or low libido and tend to wanna get their testosterone checked out. And so it's a lab, so we can do that in the blood work. Um, it's seen in a lot of medical conditions. Patients can have diabetes, be overweight, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease. It's even seen in um, COPD, so like chronic uh, pulmonary disease, opioid, uh, opioid dependence. Um, all these things have been linked to uh, low testosterone levels as well as age, but not always, right? You, just because you're older doesn't mean your sex drive changes. Um, function can sometimes change, but does it necessarily mean a low sex drive. Um, but the symptoms are fatigue, uh, depression, and then we have this uh, specific symptoms to low testosterone, which is lack, loss of body hair, um, sexual dysfunction. So that could look like erectile dysfunction. They can even have hot flashes, organicomastia, which is a breast in, enlargement for men. So that's not normal. So those are things or signs when we'd want to check the testosterone levels. So um, how do we diagnose it? We do blood work on um, two separate occasions and there's two episodes of low testosterone Then we know that that person um, may need some treatment, right? So treatment for um, testosterone replacement therapy is only approved by the FDA for men that have the hypogonadism as well. So this could look like um, the loss of body hair, the sexual dysfunction, the hot flashes, the gynecomastia. It's not approved just because you're older and your testosterone is low. That's the off-label use. So that's a conversation to have because taking hormone replacement does have its risks. There's a lot of side effects, including prostate cancer, uh, clots, cardiovascular disease. So it's a conversation to have um, with your primary care provider or an endocrinologist, um, again, whoever you have easier access to, to uh, or even urology. Um, but as you can see, uh, I put in here, everybody agrees. So the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, Urology, Clinical Pathology, and Endocrine all agree that we do not prescribe testosterone unless the parameters are met, okay? Because the risk is high of 
the clots, the cardiovascular disease, as well as um, prostate cancer. So it's a conversation to have. It's important, but it's a conversation to have with your um, clinician. So sexually transmitted infections um, are very common. And we're gonna go through the most common, um, starting with bacterial infections. So diseases uh, such as the STIs uh, are spread through sexual contact, whether that be vaginal, anal, or oral sex. Um, there's 19 million new cases diagnosed every year. Um, and there's a direct correlation to number of partners. So the risk is the more partners you have, the more risk you have for an, an STI. Um, and so what we counsel, so when patients come in and they tell me that they have multiple partners, the advice is to use condoms. The other thing I tell patients about their sexual health is if you are sexually active with multiple partners, um, you should use condoms with all and also get tested every three months that you have a new partner. Because this is how we have been able, this is how we can catch like HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia and, and treat it. Because if you don't treat it, it just kind of keeps circling around in the community, which is why we have 19 million new cases every year. Um, and so symptoms, right? Sometimes it can be none, no symptoms, right? So people are sexually active, they're not having symptoms and it's just spreading, right? And then the, the flip side to that, there could be a lot of symptoms, right? Um, so the most common STIs are bacterial. Um, there's uh, last, uh, in 2021, there was 2.5 million reported new cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. So when patients come in to see me, I will screen them for these things if they're sexually active, and of course, they want to test. Uh, well, syphilis is really contagious. Um, it presents about one to five weeks later after the sexual encounter, um, and it can look like um, or present as a painless sore on the penis, the mouth, or anus, and it can be um, associated with fever, rash, and the rash is, sorry, the rash is specific to the palms and the soles um, and flu-like symptoms. There is treatment, of course, because it's a uh, bacteria. So we have antibiotics um, and we can diagnose it through blood. It's actually a clinical diagnosis. When you see this, th this in practice, you know, you can identify it and we usually just treat um, in the moment. We don't wait for any blood work to come back. Um, the number one treatment is actually penicillin. Um, and so that's tried and true. And then if there's allergies to penicillin, we have other options. Now, syphilis is dangerous because it can um, move right? Any infection anywhere can move, right? So we're, it's important to treat as soon as possible. Uh, damage to the brain, heart, and spinal cord, as well as death are things that can happen with syphilis, which sometimes people are not aware of. So it's very important that if any of this presents, you just come in and get the treatment. And then, you know, we also try to treat the partners if, if the partners are, you know, within 60 days of contact. Then we have chlamydia, which is the number one bacterial um, STI in the US. 50% of males tend to be asymptomatic or they can present in one to three weeks later with a thin, clear discharge from the penis, a burning sensation in the penis or scrotum. Again, diagnosis is with uh, urine, but a lot of times um, with STIs, because they can linger or they can move, we just treat. So if you were told, hey, by a partner that you have, I have chlamydia and you come in to get treated or you have the symptoms, you're just gonna get treated. Um, and this is recommended um, to also treat the, the partners, right? Any partners within the 60 days. So the biggest complication or one of the complications for um, chlamydia is uh, sterility. It can cause um, men to not be able to have children. So, you know, we treat it. Gonorrhea is the most common uh, STI in the world. Um, it can present between three to 30 days later. A uh, same thing, burning feeling when urinating, uh, yellowish or greenish discharge from the penis. Um, diagnosis is again through urine, but again, we treat in the moment. So if a patient comes in and they have any of these symptoms, we just treat. Um, blindness can occur if uh, gonorrhea is in contact with the eyes. Um, so if any of you have children, um, you know that they were given an antibiotic. Oops, sorry an antibiotic, oops, sorry, I went back, when they were in the hospital for the eyes when they're born. So um, everything 
that I mentioned for the bacterial STIs, we have treatment for. So that's great, but also a lot of it is prevention, right? So using condoms, making sure that um, we're screening for these things. Um, then we have viral sexually transmitted um, infections, which again, I just picked out the top three. Um, herpes is the most common worldwide. Um, symptoms can present about a week later. Um, it can be associated with tingling, itching, small painful blisters that can appear on the penis, mouth, anus, butt, or thighs. It's not always uh, to the genital area. It can be in the proximity. So butt, thighs, or other places that patients can have um, these lesions. Um, and then diagnosis is clinical. Um, a lot of times when we see this in practice, you know what it is, um, but you can always do a swab and send it to the lab and we use a PCR test or um, blood to confirm everything. And so the thing with herpes is it's something that, that stays dormant in our body, meaning that we can treat it, but we don't get rid of it. So we use medication every time a person has an outbreak, right? So if they have the lesions, we treat it. Some patients can go the rest of their life and never have an outbreak. And some patients, they get outbreaks all the time. So there's different approaches. Some patients need daily medicine, which is suppression medicine. Other patients, they'll just use the medicine if they get an outbreak. Um, this can lead to a lot of issues that we see in primary care, like depression. Um, people um, or you know, men can get um, discouraged or uh, don't want to have other sexual partners after they've been diagnosed with this. So you know, it's something that we screen for to see what's the mental status of the patient, because this is a very common thing, but it's also treatable. And then it's just having a, a conversation with your partners um, about this. Okay, so you're, we're not spreading it to our partners. Okay, and then again, using condoms and um, screening. HIV um, is another very common uh, STI. Um, it can present one to three months after exposure, and it can look like fever, malaise, which is like fatigue, uh, body aches, rash, sore throat. It's very nonspecific. It kind of presents like everything else. Um, so this is the most probably uh, common uh, reason that patients come in because they're like, I don't know, I feel off, I'm not well. And then, you know, we do the test by blood and uh, we have positives come back, right? Um, and this can be in any age group, right? If, if you're a sexually active person, you can get a sexually transmitted infection. It's just um, the way that it uh, moves in a host, right? So we can get it through bodily fluids. So it's um, important to, again, use condoms and then disclosing to your partners as well so we can prevent the spread. And then there is treatment. Um, again, not a cure, but it's a treatment. Patients uh, have medication that they can take daily, um, and it's usually lifetime. Because there's a lot of complications with HIV, um, AIDS, which is uh, the immunodepression uh, uh, deficiency syndrome, right? So that you cannot fight infections like you could before. So you can get really, really sick all the time and that's gonna require its own treatment. And so this is like the end stage of HIV. So we really try to prevent patients from getting to that point because that's when they're really sick and they can um, uh, die from being in that state. Um, so we really try to get them into care and on treatment. Um, but then there's cardiovascular risks, right? Um, because this is an inflammatory process that's happening, right? You have, there's something going around in the blood that's creating increased risk for people to have cardiovascular issues as well. So it's not only the infections part, um, it can also affect your cardiovascular health. Um, then we have human papilloma virus, which um, is actually the number one STI in the U.S., um, it's presents with warts, right? So we see in the diagram, it can have these cauliflower-like warts with itching and irritation. It can be found in the penis or in the mouth or throat. Um, we, again, this is a clinical diagnosis. If you see this, you essentially know what it is because this is, you know, what you study. Um, but you can always confirm with a tissue sample and send it to the lab to confirm. And there's treatment for this. We can remove the warts. Uh, we start, um, uh, there's treatment, topical treatments, um, and if that doesn't work, then we can do the removal. Um, but really the key is vaccination, right? So um, the ACIP, which is uh, the governing board for um, immunizations uh, that we follow for guidelines in this country, recommended HPV vaccination starting at the age of 11 um, 
to prevent, right? So there's about 200 strains of HPV. Um, most of them are, are benign, but there's a few that are cancer causing and also cause the warts. So that's why we start vaccinating um, at 11 years old because we want to vaccinate uh, people before or children before they become sexually active, right? So that we're uh, preventing this type of uh, issue. And again, since it's a virus, it lives with us and it may not do anything to us, but we carry it. So we try to uh, be preventative in this approach by starting the vaccinations. Okay, and then moving on to, so a, a major issue that brings in uh, patients is gonna be erectile dysfunction. Um, and this is defined as the inability to obtain or maintain an erection sufficient for satisfactory sexual performance. Um, and this is a conversation that is hard for a lot of male patients, but you know, they'll come in and sometimes the uh, spouses will come in or the partners, you know, or uh, whoever, you know, may have a issue with it. And so it does push patients to come in, but again, we want patients to come in before, because sometimes this could be a late symptom of something else that was already going on. So like the heart hypertension, the high cholesterol, mm -hmm. So these are the, th oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, these are the things that have um, been probably ongoing and now the patient's presenting with erectile dysfunction. So erectile dysfunction can happen at any age. Um, we have a tendency to see it in younger men due to psycho, psych, psych, not psych issues, but relationship issues, performance anxiety, depression. Um, it's not usually like diabetes or high blood pressure. Um, so that's why, Erectile dysfunction can happen at any age, um, but the younger the patient is, it tends to be more so um, a mental, like they're having some anxiety about, you know, performance and things like that. It can be ongoing or it can happen occasionally, okay, sometimes with new partners. Um, it could be just marital discord even or relationship issues that can cause this. Um, but then the physical causes of where we want patients to come in sooner is because this can be the symptom of a heart disease a high blood pressure, diabetes, the effects of smoking or alcoholism, back injuries, right? If you had an accident that uh, affected your lower back that hurt some nerves there, testosterone deficiency, prostate issues, right? Surgeries that maybe a nerve was damaged or um, as you can see here listed a lot, a lot of medications, right? So sometimes, you know, it's, it's drugs, sometimes it's over-the-counter stuff. Um, so even just looking through your entire medication list is important to go through with your clinician so that we can see if maybe we can change what you're taking so that, you know, we can avoid the erectile dysfunction. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of psychological causes, which tends to be the majority for younger men, but for older men, we're more concerned about um, physical issues or some underlying disease. Treatment, um, so you treat what's wrong, right? If there's high blood pressure, you treat that. If the patient is a smoker, you try to get them to stop smoking, right? Again, reduction of alcohol, exercise, weight loss, uh, reduced caffeine use, um, exercise, all the things that we've mentioned throughout the theme of this, right? Medicine is available. Um, probably many of you know, you've seen the commercials, Viagra, Cialis. There's a ton of medications out there in the market that some men would benefit from. Vacuum devices, and we even have penile implants, right? So those are things that you would then escalate to urology to if that's something that the patient wants to consider, or I would refer them to urology. Then last, um, for this system, we have the testicular cancer, which is very common in younger men. Um, I thought it was important to mention it um, because I wasn't sure of the age group in here, but I think it's important because again, it's um, seen in young men, 15 to 34 years of age, seen uh, principally in uh, uh, white, Hispanic and American Indian Alaskan natives. Um, there are some risk factors. So we do see it in patients that might have had like an undescended testes when they were young, when they were babies, personal or family history of testicular cancer, their age, ethnicity, and um, infertility issues. And then uh, patients that have a really poor diet. Um, there's a lot of different symptoms. If you look on this table, um, it could be acute, just pain in the testes or scrotum, a dull ache in the uh, abdomen, firmness painless mass in the testicle, scrotal heaviness or swelling. And then if we're thinking that this has spread, then we're gonna see more systemic symptoms in addition to the 
isolated scrotal symptoms, right? So it could be headaches, low back pain, neck mass, respiratory issues, gynecomastia, right? Um, so lots of symptoms. Uh, again, diagnosis was going to be with a good history and physical, and, and usually we send patients for ultrasound to uh, identify the mass. Um, there is treatment. Usually it's uh, surgical, uh, removing the cancer uh, where the cancer is, and active surveillance, chemotherapy, um, radiation. Uh, so this is, of course, going to be handled by the specialist. But um, there is a five-year survival rate, which is 97%, which is very high with effective treatment. But again, it does come from early identification. And another thing for young, since this is affecting a young population, um, then there's the conversation about if they want to have children in the future, um, you know, we talk about sperm banking, similar to freezing your eggs for women. So we're, next, we're going to talk about the endocrinology system. So again, I picked out the most important things that uh, really we see in primary care. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, but these are the, the key things that I think are important for um, patients and their loved ones for coming in, right? So um, diabetes is a huge topic. Um, and so what is diabetes, right? It's a group of metabolic diseases that is characterized by hyperglycemia or high sugar, blood sugar, that results in uh, defects in your insulin secretion, or insulin action or both, right? So there's an issue with how your body is responding to insulin, right? And then this high level of sugars that then go on to affect the entire body, right? So because the blood flow, right? The sugar is in the blood and it can affect all the organs, right? Because the blood flows everywhere. So this is probably the most common diagnosed disease in primary care. So again, this is important to get your loved ones in to see someone because we can diagnose it, we can treat it. Um, and again, 50% of deaths are preventable in men, right? Uh, diabetes does cause a lot of death and not from the diabetes itself, but it tends to be the complications, right? Um, 22 million uh, US adults are affected by this. And we're talking specifically about type two diabetes, uh, not type one, which is a different type of diabetes. Um, the risk factors come from being overweight, um, family history, poor diet and activity, again, comorbid issues, so high blood pressure, the high cholesterol. Sometimes patients are going to come in with symptoms and sometimes they're not. Um, symptoms can look like excessive thirst or hunger. Um, it can look like urinary frequency. It could be weight loss. It could be weight gain, um, blurred vision, fatigue, um, numbness or tingling in the feet a lot of times, even burning sensation. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's both. It's not just the one, but you know, it's not um, uncommon to see one, but two tends to be more of a signature. Then we have um, another thing that is um, easily missed, right? So not by the clinician, but by the patients because they dismiss it. So uh, sometimes men can get like uh, penile uh, yeast infections, right? And, or just getting a uh, rash in the thighs and groin area, right? Or in the feet, right? Fungal disease, we see a lot of that in diabetes. So that could be another sign. And so coming in to check that out, why or why it's not going away or why it's not healing is important. Um, and then like this slow to heal, right? So you have a wound and, you know, you're taking like months to heal. That's not normal um, for patients. So that's the time for patients to come in. So we, we screen and we diagnose, um, we use blood work. Uh, we can use a fasting uh, glucose, which if there's a reading of more than 126, uh, two times, that's diagnostic. If the A1C is above 6.5, 6.5 or above, it's diagnostic and a non-fasting glucose of 200 just one time um, is diagnostic. So um, treatment, again, goes back to just the whole picture, right? We have, we have our diet, we have our exercise, our weight management. Diet is specific to like a low sugar carbohydrate uh, diet, but again, just overall healthy eating, which I'm gonna go into a little more depth on the next few slides. And we give patients an opportunity to do that for three months. All right. If in three months it's not better, then the next conversation will be medication. Some patients need medication right away. If a patient comes back with a 14 on their A1C, that sugar is 500 or better on a regular day. That is too high risk. So medicine is immediately recommended because 
the risk of having a diabetic coma, a heart attack, or any other complication of diabetes is so high. So medication is recommended. Now, a common question that I get in, in primary care is, do I have to stay on medicine? Well, it really depends on the patient, right? There are certain things that you need to treat. Infections, you need the treatment. Diabetes, a lot of times patients need, need the treatment, but they can manage it with a diet and exercise and weight control. There's this fine line of uh, consistency, right? So like the more consistent that you are, the less medicine you can have. Some patients still need medicine because there's always the uh, insulin resistance part to diabetes. And so that part, there's no fix for that, right? It's just the, where insulin is received, those little proteins are defective. So they're never gonna be repaired. There's no medicine for that yet. But um, a lot of times it's in, really gonna be in conjunction with your diet and exercise. Um, and so why do we stress about treating diabetes? Well, di diabetes is a multi-organ um, disease, meaning that it affects everything. So blindness is one of the number one causes of blindness, renal failure, neuropathy, so that numbness, tingling, and burning sensation, poor wound healing, um, increased risk for cardiovascular events, heart attack, stroke, and then limb, limb amputation. So a lot of complications, a lot of issues with diabetes. So we're really aggressive when we try to treat this because we know that in the long run, it's going to be better for the patient. Um, and a lot of it, again, it's going to circle around their general health, eating better, exercising, keeping your weight in check. So a lot of every, uh, the things that I recommended had to do with diet and nutrition. So I just want to talk a little bit more specifically and give you um just a general approach to nutrition. Um, we have a great nutrition department in Valley. So, uh, you know, patients are referred there all the time to get advice and tailor to their personal um, dietary needs. So if you look on at the pictures, it's a little bit of everything, right? Um, you can have a balanced diet. It's all about portions and uh, what you should eat more of versus not, right? So anything that's colorful is always welcome. So if you look at the fruits and vegetables. Your plate should mostly have these things, but of course you can have your carbs if it's measured. You can have some dairy, again, if it's measured and then your proteins, right? So if even if you follow a vegan, a vegetarian or just a general diet, um, there's options, right? Like you can eat, if you like meat, you can eat meat. If you don't eat meat, then you eat other tofu and, and there's ways to um, really cater to what your and then there's cultural norms, right? So in primary care, you see patients from all this United Nations. So you have Filipino diet, a Spanish diet, black diet, whatever. There's all types of diets and so, or cultural norms rather. So what people will typically eat. This is the hardest conversation to have with patients because we are programmed since we are in our mother's uterus, uh, how to eat. So. This requires a lot of work for patients. And so having the conversation and just giving them the guidance on how to eat what you eat and then how to eat it better so that you have better health, essentially is the conversation that I always strive to have with patients because as you can see, everything starts with your diet and nutrition. Diet um, in the statistics show 60% of adults, men are overweight, right? Um, and there's a just a tendency, right? There's a large portions that are served. There's excess of fat, sugar, and salt. Um, this is just generalized. So it affects everyone, right? And so it's really hard to eat healthy because sometimes just the options aren't great, but also it's the decisions that we make, right? So you should be eating a high fiber diet. You can eat bread, you can eat pasta, you can eat quinoa, you can eat all those nice yummy things, but there's a measurement, one slice of bread or half a cup of the other um, carbs. Should be whole grain, right? Cause those offer the most nutrition and least processed option. Vegetable and fruit take should be the highest intake about two to three cups daily. Um, good sources of fats and oils looks like olive oil, nuts, uh, salmon, avocado. And when you're reading your labels, it's poly or monosaturated fats, right? So we should make a habit of reading the labels, right? Dairy, um, opting for a low fat, or if a person is lactose intolerant, they should opt for lactose free things. And this should be one to two cups of milk or yogurt, and then two ounces of cheese, right? So everything you can eat well, but you have to 
portion things, or you can eat a variety, just portioning. Same thing with meat, poultry, or fish. Um, again, five to six ounces of lean meat, poultry, one egg, or a quarter cup of beans, okay? And now this is just a guideline, but this can vary amongst patients, right? Because men, if it's a taller man, a little bigger man, like big bone structure, things like that, he might have more needs than this, and that's fine. But actually having a conversation with someone who's a specialist, like a nutrition, uh, a nutritionist, a dietitian, your primary care doctor, you know, talk about what the quantity is, is very important. And then um, just uh, the uh, myplate.gov has this, and it's actually really neat because they do it for different ethnicities and races. And you can see like the quantity, right? Like if you're going to eat like some mac and cheese, it, a quarter cup, half a cup, a quarter cup, it's there, right? So it, this, if you go on myplate.gov, it shows you again, a visual representation of what your plate should look like. And if you see Half of the plate is always the bright and, and colorful foods, which are our fruits and vegetables, a little bit of carbs, a little bit of protein, um, and that should make you feel happy and satisfied so that we're not overeating or snacking. Um, and then, of course, moving on to fitness, right? So exercise. Bene there's no reason that anyone can exercise if they're able to. Yes, patients have disabilities, people have injuries. Uh, so there's, you have to find what works for you. Um, because yes, some people are not able to exercise because they have certain limitations. And so what are the benefits? We know that it prevents heart disease, it helps with diabetes, your cholesterol, weight gain, and cancers, right? Reduces your stress levels, helps control people's mood, it improves sleep, it improves concentration. I mean, the studies are endless out there that exercise is the key to a good, healthy life. Um, it can prolong the onset of arthritis and bone density loss and memory loss in um, our aging populations. What kind of exercise are recommended? Well, anything that's aerobic, so gets the heart pumping, that can look like walking, running, hiking, bike riding, golf, swimming, skiing, tennis, whatever you like to do, but Cardiovascular exercise is fat burning exercise. So that is recommended. And then strength training as well, or sprinting if you prefer that. How much should you do? So when patients haven't been active for a long time, I always recommend to start slow. That could be like five minutes a day. And every week you increment to, uh, to another five minutes, so 10 minutes. So you get to at least to 20 minutes or more. Um, the American Heart Association recommends at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. Um, and the goal should be at least 30 to 60 minutes most days of the week, right? So if you calculate, that's about 150 minutes. And then for patients that do have disabilities, um, you should do what you can, right? You don't, you shouldn't do activities that can cause you harm or, or, or worsen um, any back issues or thing, things like that, or surgeries. Some people have like back surgery, things like that, that limit them. So there's a website for the, uh, the National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability where patients can refer to, to see what exercises are appropriate for them. And then uh, weight, right? So weight control, we really need to, this is probably um, the most important thing that all patients and everybody has to work on because we, as a country, we spend about $30 billion on diet programs. I didn't know that until I did this presentation. I didn't know it was $30 billion, um, which is a lot of money. Um, and what happens, um, a lot of failure, right? Because we get sold the magic pill, the easy surgeries, or in all these things. And um, there's nothing easy about losing weight. And if anyone has tried to lose weight, you know that it's hard. So I talk to my patients about achievable, sustainable goals. It is recommended that patients lose 12 to 15 pounds in a year over time, slow and steady over dramatic weight loss. Now, um, it's difficult, but it's not impossible, right? And so this is why we give small achievable goals. One to two pounds per month is a lot more achievable than saying, I wanna lose 90 pounds. 90 pounds is a lot of weight to lose. Again, people do it without any, anything like surgery or things like that, but it really requires a lot of consistency. And we know that things are gonna come up. You're gonna get sick, your child gets sick, your loved one gets sick, work, um, holidays, celebration, vacations, you name it. Whatever your life brings to you, you're going to have disruptions in your diet and your exercise. So 
again, going back to reducing your caloric intake and increasing your exercise. That is the formula. You eat a little bit less and you exercise a little bit more. It takes exactly 3,500 calories to be burned to lose a pound. The opposite is also true. If you eat more and exercise less, then you gain, right? So it's just math. Um, and so what would that look like for people? Cutting back, you know, about 250 calories in the diet, exercise about another 250, that's 500 in a day, multiply by seven, boom, you've lost a pound in a week, okay? And a lot of times it's really having patience to lose the weight, right? Um, it takes about three months for patients on average to kind of get this routine in. And then it takes another three months for them to, for them to see the weight loss, right? So if you consistently do this, um, and I tell my patients this all the time, if you are consistent, you will see the weight loss. If you're not consistent, you will not. It's it's just math, right? Um, so doing this for six months, if you calculate, it comes out to a 25 pound weight loss. Now I know I said 12 to 15 pounds, but that's slow and steady. 25 pounds, if you can do that in the way that it's um, healthy for you, because not all patients can do that, um, right? It depends their medical issues, then sure. But um, a lot of times it will come with having that conversation with your doctor or nurse practitioner, whoever you see for your primary care, and then um, even talking to your nutri nutritionist so you're getting the right um, nutrition that you need for your body to function and also cater to whatever medical issues you have, right? So cholesterol, blood pressure. So once people lose the weight, um, you have to maintain it, right? So now you've got to keep the low fat diet. You need to, um, you know, have dessert, but just use portion control. Um, eating breakfast is important um, so that we don't overeat later. Um, intermittent fasting is okay for some people, but not everybody. Um, particularly, we don't recommend intermittent fasting for like patients that have diabetes or you know have to take certain medications. So again, a conversation to have with your um, primary care provider to see that's appropriate for you. Um, cutting back on alcohol, cutting, eating, trying to eat home versus takeout, or if you do eat a lot of takeout because that's just the way your life is, making better choices, right? So a baked potato over, sorry, a baked potato over french fries, right? Um, yes, the french fries are probably tastier, uh, but again, it's you wanna maintain your weight because a lot of times what I see in practice, patients are like, oh, I haven't seen the doctor in 10 years and they come and see me and I look at the grid, in the 10 years, they've gained 40 pounds and they didn't even realize it, right? Because they weren't checking in. They were just like, oh, here I am today after two years. And then I look, I'm like, well, in 2012, you were this and now you're this. So, you know, it's something we have to keep an eye on and work on. Um, and then just getting into the habit of uh, limiting caffeine use, no more than two to three cups daily. Reading the ingredients in nutrition labels is very important because a lot of things are falsely advertised. So you actually have to read it, make sure that you're eating nutritious food and not processed food. Uh, drinking a lot of water and eating as fresh as possible and a lot of more exercise, right? So parking your car on the other side of the parking lot, walking more, taking the stairs. Um, these are ways to continuously be active. So another important topic um, that now relates to your me mental health for um, patients is memory changes, right? So we see this a lot. Um, oh, and I... I think I deleted a sentence, sorry. So dementia uh, is a loss of not only uh, changes in memory, but it's actually um, physical changes that patients can experience or cognitive changes, as we say. And what does that mean? So it can look like a person that has memory changes, but also forgets to do basic things. And what are basic things? So we uh, think of that as their daily living activities, right? So it can look like a patient that forgets to brush their teeth, uh, take a bath, get dressed. They don't know how to put their shirt on correctly. They don't have to tie their shoes. So if you've had children or you've been around children, it's everything that we're taught in those primary years, essentially we lose with dementia. So this is where we know that there's something more going on than just the memory issue, right? That they're just not forgetting. Oh, wait, where did I put my keys? No, it's like they literally are forgetting how to function, how to care for themselves. And so this is a very common issue. It's the fifth leading cause of death of um, Americans in older than 65. 
Um, and there's a, a couple of risk factors, right? We know that if it's in the family, um, there's a risk. If you have cardiovascular issues, so, uh, stroke issues, diabetes, obesity, any use of uh, certain use of medications, um, then there's some genetics uh, involved, and then also just lower education level, which is more associated with like knowing what right things to eat, access to health care, things like that. Um, so social issues. Um, so we screen patients at these annual visits, right? If if a patient comes in or a relative comes in and they're saying, hey, I, I'm noticing these changes, we do screenings and then we do confirmatory screenings. And then um, it involves a history and physical. There's a ton of questions that we ask um, to see what's the daily living activity of this patient with, besides the memory changes, right? So that again, we can stratify, is this mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? Because um, patients, when they begin to lose the ability to care for themselves, they will need help to um, just do everything, right? 24 hour care a lot of times. And you know, there a lot of times it can be very sudden. And so um, patients will require a lot of care. Um, and so we screen for these things. We screen, um, make sure it's not a, de a depression, right? Or is it a, a lab issue, right? Is there a deficiency in nutrition um, and vitamins uh, that's causing this cognitive impairment? Uh, we look at what patients are taking for medicine because maybe it's a med medicine issue. And, and ultimately, you know, we'll get uh, imaging of the brain as well. Um, and so what does the treatment look like? Um, a lot of times it's treating what's ever causing this issue. Um, then if it's a, a formal diagnosis of dementia like Alzheimer's, then there are a trial of therapy with uh, the cholinesterase inhibitors or memantine, which some of you may know as uh, the, the nepazil. Um, so this is uh, has like a 50-50 um, outcome uh, as far as like improvement. Um, and it really takes a lot out of the family to be involved in the care. So um, having these conversations early, what is what are the goals of the patient? Uh, what are the goals of the family? What are the finances like? What are the um, the long term plan living? Because a lot of times we have older patients that um, they'll have dementia, but then they don't have any advanced care planning. So where are they going to live? Who's going to take care of them? Are there kids around? Or is nobody around? Do they even have kids? You know, like it's a lot. So a lot of times we'll get these um, patients, and they may be advanced or they may not be advanced, and then we we link them into the proper care and social support that they may need, right? Because sometimes it's just even a living situation that has to be addressed. Um, and then one of the other parts that are important when we're having a screening, um, the annual visit with your primary care provider is uh, depression, right? So like we know that it affects at least 8% of people in the United States, which is about 16.1 million people. Um, for men, it's specifically concerning because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a major risk factor for suicide, especially in older men, and this increases with age. So a lot of times we see that it can come from um, a lot of risk factors, a lot of trauma. Um, there was a study done on um, adverse childhood events, uh, which has been shown to cause a lot of um, depression, anxiety, and, and other physical issues with patients. Um, so this could be like a, a abuse. Um, chronic medical conditions, uh, family issues, divorce, lifetime traumas, um, education status, your social life, parental loss. You know, a lot of people uh, fall into depression with grief. Um, so although we do see this in a, in a broad spectrum of ages, right? It's not only the, for the young, it can happen when you're older. Some people have a chronic depression. Some people can have episodes of depression. So it's important to come in to get screened because every visit we screen patients, like we ask the questions, these are the symptoms um, people can present. And, and they may not think it's a, um, a symptom of depression, but there's actually things that we screen for specifically. So sleep, is there a change in sleep pattern? Is there a change in interest? Is there any guilt, hopelessness, helplessness, energy uh, deficiency, feeling like just sluggish all the time, changes in concentration, appetite issues, eating more, eating less, uh, really agitated, irritable. In men, again, it may not present as depression or sadness. It can be irritability or anger. Um, and then of course, suicide uh, thoughts, right? This Or history of suicide, things like that. Um, so the United States Preventive Service Task Force, which is um, an evidence-based uh, medicine group that, um, gives out guidelines, you know, it recommends to screen everyone starting at the age of 12. 
um, and the American Academy of Family Physicians, which uh, supports this screening. So this is done essentially in every primary care visit um, because it's been shown to capture a lot of patients that would otherwise not come in and talk about this, right? Because they may come and talk about the sleep, but not the depression. And then this is where we can pick it up. Um, the formal diagnosis um, is confirmed. We use the psychiatric um, text of the DM5, DSM-5. Um, and then we treat, right? Primary care providers are tasked with um, treating this first line. Um, a lot of times before a patient will see a psychiatrist, we don't have enough psychiatrists to treat the amount of uh, patients that have depression. Um, so it is a primary care issue. And so this is why we stress, you know, even coming in once per year can capture this, right? And so lifestyle, right? So we talk about, again, just whole wellness, diet, exercise, weight, uh, stress management, getting people into therapy. There's a ton of, of tools nowadays, especially uh, before it was just, you had to go in person to talk to someone, now you can do telehealth, right? Um, there's medication. And then of course, if a person is suicidal, um, any person that's suicidal um, should always be uh, taken to a, an emergency room because that is a high risk for um, the person. So we definitely take that very serious and that's an automatic, like, let's get this person into care. There's also um, a hotline, a 988, that is used for patients that we give as a resource. Um, it used to be 1-800-SUICIDE, uh, uh, but they changed it to something easy. Um, 988. And what 988 will do is that they put you in touch with a crisis counselor and that counselor will talk to the patient and they will help um, connect them with someone that's in the area um, immediately, right? And so um, this person can get the care that they need. Okay. Um, and then we always talk about substance abuse uh, in these visits as well to see what patients are doing that may also impact their health, right? So if they're smoking, we ask about smoking, how much, how often, and try to get people to stop. That that's a, there, it's, There's never an advice to keep smoking. It's always to stop smoking. So we screen patients to see what their risks are. Alcohol use as well. For men, it's less. It's no more than uh, two drinks um, in a day and no more than 14 in a week, right? So if, a, if you notice or the patient notices that they're drinking a little bit more than that, then this can be detrimental to their health, right? Because we know that alcohol can cause heart issues, diabetes, the weight gain, all these things. So we always ask um, these questions to help, again, identify the risk factors that are preventable, right? So that we can cut back on the things that are excessive. Same thing with substance use. Um, there's no drug that we recommend, right? So even marijuana, although it's legal, um, I'll start there because a lot more people use marijuana than like cocaine and heroin and things like that. So marijuana is not harmless. Um, uh, it can induce psychosis, uh, schizophrenia, if there, especially if there's a strong family history of um, mental illness. And that's not to mention the lung uh, issues that can come about later in life, right? Like COPD, things like that, because you're smoking something that's going into your lungs, same thing as tobacco, right? Like it's going into the lungs, it's going to cause changes over time. So that might not be immediate, but then there are immediate things, right? So um, marijuana can slow down your reaction time. People use it and then they drive and that can cause car accidents, right? So it's not harmless, although it's legalized, but it's not harmless, right? So we, we just don't recommend any type of drugs, cocaine, heroin, nothing. So whenever we identify a patient um, that has uh, any of these issues, we try to get them into health and to get off of these substances because we know that in the long run, it will, um, if not be detrimental to their health, even uh, cause death, right? A lot of patients have died from substance abuse. Um, and so we, and then also cause a lot of family issues, right? Marital discord, relationship issues, things like that, and depression and anxiety as well. Um, so we really try to get people the help that they need whenever we identify these things as well. So in summary, um, you know, there's a, it's, it seems like a lot, but I think it's just, uh, I wanted to make like a, a, a summary, uh, the key points really, right? So with diet, exercise, weight management, drink your water, manage your stress, you know, get your vaccines up to date, screenings, um, limit substances that are like alcohol, um, safe sex as well. And just even just having a regular checkup with someone once a year, if you have no medical problems, I always tell my patients once a year is fine. 
Um, if they have medical issues, then we make a plan. Okay, I need to see you every six months, every four months, every three months, so that they know. Um, again, talking about men um, specifically, they may have certain occupations that are more hazardous than others. So talking about wearing the protective gear to protect hearing, vision, you know, wearing the goggles if they're out cutting, you know, the big trees or and whatnot. So um, wearing seatbelts, helmets, if they're riding a motorbike or a motorcycle or um, whatever is that they're doing that may be a little bit riskier. Um, we talk about all these things because it's overall health. And then this is just a um, a neat table um, that is all the screenings and recommendations that we um, talked about today, essentially from our uh, United States task force that put it together. And this is again, evidence-based medicine, meaning this has been studied across thousands of patients. And um, these are the things that we talk about in primary care and that we screen for. And we look at this on, a day-to-day -day basis and it update it as problems arise, right? So when patients come in, we're going to talk about all these things and, you know, some of it's blood work, some of it's seeing what their home life is like, diet, exercise, you know, sexual activity. So it's just like a neat um, page and then talks about like what you should be doing at what age. So resources, um, a lot, again, we talk about men not having access or lack of uh, good insurance um, or underinsured. Um, so Valley offers self-pay. Um, patients can come in, have they pay like a sliding scale. Um, so there's health fairs, there's free screening, screenings and events, free or low cost clinics. So there's ways to get in um, even if you don't have insurance. And that is my presentation. And now if any questions? Oh my goodness, this was wonderful. Thank you so much, doctor. Actually, somebody had to had to go, but he wrote, what a presentation. This is a course, not a lecture, thorough and informative. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a teacher for 55 years. Oh, great. Ago, so he yeah, really, a he, <laughs> wonderful compliment. Yes, thank you. Um, I know we're, you know, uh, I know you've taken a lot of time, but maybe just a couple quick questions. Um, someone just mentioned something that I think is on a lot of people's mind. Is an aspirin regimen beneficial to have as a preventative measure of heart disease and stroke as we've heard? That, that is a great question. So mm -hmm. aspirin um, is a big, uh, there was this change after some studies that were done that it's not beneficial to everyone. So it's tailored to certain populations, right? So before it was okay, everybody above, you know, whatever age is getting aspirin, but we found that that was actually not effective because the bleeding risk. So now it's tailored to what's the patient's age, what are their medical problems, and then it's a shared decision making um, with your provider. So a lot of times you will see like patients with high blood pressure, patients that have diabetes and cholesterol or stroke are still recommended aspirin. But again, it can, it can be that they're not if there's some risk involved, right? So they have gastric issues, bleeding, things like that. So again, it just really comes now down, it's a patient by patient um, recommendation. Wonderful. And mm -hmm. just one more question. I'm gonna read it to you because I want to make sure I get it right. You mentioned that ED may be a symptom of high cholesterol. If tests come back as within the normal range, then ED is from another cause? or can there be a small blockage? That's a good question. With normal cholesterol. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. So again, um, if, if a patient is experiencing ED, um, the best thing is to get evaluated, right? Because you can check the blood flow to see if there's a blockage there, even if the cholesterol is normal, right? Because it could be in that time. Remember labs give us a snapshot in time. We're like, okay, this is how the patient is right now. But who you could have two years ago had a, a really high cholesterol and then the plaque build and then that caused it, right? So it's not always based on just like the lab. That's why we have to have a history of physical, old lab work, new lab work. And then we put all that information together. But again, if, if a patient is experiencing erectile dysfunction, then we can check the arterial blood flow and see if it's coming from there or another source. Because- the blockage could not doesn't have to necessarily be in the penis. It could be higher up. So a lot of times it could be in this area, the aorta. So it, yeah, it would require just a workup. 
wonderful. This was just great. And I'm just seeing if there was another. Oh, somebody else said it was a wonderful.